Loving Father in heaven, I thank you so much for your power, your presence, your pardon, your pity. Thank you that you're watching over each of us. Thank you that you accept us just the way we are, sinful, poor, needy, weak, but you're in love with us. Don't understand it fully, but we accept it. And I just pray, pour out your Holy Spirit, Lord, as we open your word. In Jesus' name, we can all say amen. amen. As we continue amazing prophecies tonight, we are going to look at a very powerful, powerful prophecy in the Bible. God's love in the fires of hell. But I like to begin with this scripture, Psalm 62 and verse 8. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Amen and amen. Tonight is a hot message. Tonight, as it were, you're in the hot seat because we're looking at a subject entitled God's Love in the Fires of Hell. Revelation's hottest prophecy, Beyond Armageddon's Ashes. Beyond Armageddon's Ashes. Jesus came to die for our sins and save us from eternal death. Take your Bible and turn with me to the book of Revelation. This is a prophecy seminar. What kind of seminar? Prophecy seminar. We're going to the book of Revelation, and I would like you to take, take you, your Bible and turn with me to Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19, looking there at verse 20, all right? Give you a moment to locate that. I was watching by television. I hope you get your Bible out. Here we go, verse 20. And I'm going to let you fill in some blanks. All right, here we go. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast. So the Bible makes it very clear. The mark of the beast is a deception. Those who receive the mark of the beast are deceived, but it gets worse from there. The Bible says here, and those who worship his image, these two, and along with all those who went along with the mark of the beast, were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. Is there a hell fire? There is. According to the word of God, and I'm going to show you very clearly, there will be a lake of fire. You say, will be? What's that all about? We're going to discover I want you to notice, does the book of Revelation identify and spotlight a lake of fire? Yes or no? Does the Bible make it clear that those who go along with the mark of the beast are going to go to hell? So tonight, we need to understand hell fire. Because every single person who does not make it, every person who is not saved, will ultimately be thrust, thrust or thrown, cast into the lake of fire. The book of Revelation is a book of contrast, stark contrast. You've got the sea of glass, Revelation 15, and you've got the lake of fire. Take your Bible and turn with me to Revelation chapter 15. Revelation 15. I want you to take your Bible and turn there to verse Verse number two, and I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire, but this is not the lake of fire. It's in heaven. And how many agree there is no hellfire in heaven? And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire. And those who have the victory over the beast, over his image, over his mark, over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. They sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are your ways, O King of saints. So I want you to notice here, the Bible makes it very clear. Victory, sea of glass. Defeat, lake of fire. We see that from these scriptures we have read thus far. Amen? We see that. So there is no question that the saved are going to go to heaven. And Revelations 21 and 22 describes to us the bliss and glories of heaven and how we're going to walk face to face with God and how he's going to dwell with us. And the Bible says that ultimately heaven is going to dwell on earth. The meek shall inherit the earth, Matthew 5 and verse 5. But we know that we're going to inherit this earth after it has been cleansed by fire. The Bible makes it very clear. When the earth is inhabited, 
ultimately, it's going to be renewed. The Bible says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, Revelation 21. So we know the destiny of the righteous ultimately is a purified, renewed earth. I would not want to inherit this place the way it is now. Can you say amen? But the Bible says that happens after the millennium. You read this in Revelation 20, 21, and 22. You have a sequence there. You have the thousand years and then you have the, the wicked being thrown into hell fire, as we will see. And you have the earth being purified and made anew. And the Bible makes it very clear that the wicked are going to be destroyed. Now look at Revelation chapter 20 and verse 9. The Bible says that after the millennium, the wicked encircle the new Jerusalem. Because according to the Bible, the new Jerusalem descends upon earth, upon the Mount of Olives. Zechariah 14 says it splits the Mount of Olives. And the Bible says that we have reigned with Christ a thousand years, and then we with Jesus descend in that new Jerusalem that John saw in Revelation 21, verses 1 and 2. And it descends... And the Bible makes it clear that that city is a mega city. It's about the size of the state of Oregon. Can you say mega city? And so the Bible makes it very clear that the wicked are resurrected in the resurrection of damnation and the resurrection of condemnation, John 5, 28 and 29. And the Bible says that the devil deceives them into thinking they can overtake the city and make it to the tree of life and eat the fruit and perpetuate life and have eternal life. As if God could be overthrown. Because you see, the Lamb and the Father are there in the midst of that city with the saved saints. Can you say amen? And the Bible says... As we're perched on the walls of New Jerusalem, the Bible says the wicked are going to try to overtake the city, but what is going to happen? Revelation 20 and verse 9. The Bible says here, all right, they, the wicked that have been resurrected, went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, that's New Jerusalem, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. It did what? It devoured them. It annihilated them. Now, this conjures up questions. Right about now, if this subject is new to you, you have some questions swirling, swirling in your mind. And so we have questions about hellfire. Well, one thing for sure is that preachers in the past have rivaled each other in their descriptions, their graphic descriptions of the agonies and torments of hell. It is said that preachers like Dr. Samuel Hopkins uh, have been able in times past, he was an eloquent preacher of the 19th century, they would preach with such eloquence and such a command of vocabulary that they were able with word pictures to describe the torments and agonies of hell so profoundly and so graphically that it was if, as if their congregations would feel the hot flames licking about their feet. Well, let me tell you something. Here is what this preacher said uh, there uh, in times past. The smoke of their torments, talking about the fate of the wicked, the smoke of their torment shall ascend up forever in the sight of the blessed before their eyes. He continues. And this display of divine character and glory will be in favor of the redeemed. And what did he say? Most entertaining and give the highest pleasure to those who love God. In other words, he's saying, and apparently this was typical of these, uh, of these preachers rivaling, rivaling one another. He was basically saying here, it's going to be entertaining. In other words, this would be religious entertainment. We get a front row seat being able to see uh, uh, uncle so-and-so who didn't make it, grandma so-and-so, they didn't make it, but look at them now. I want you to notice here, he continues, he's not done yet. Should the eternal torment and fires be extinguished, it would in a great measure put an end to the happiness and glory of the blessed, the works of Samuel Hopkins. Can you imagine that? Well, that's nothing. Preachers, even today, and especially in bygone days, have used then continue to use the threat of hell to scare people into heaven. 
And it's true, we need to preach hellfire. But could it be this topic has been greatly abused and misused? One preacher said the fires of hell are so hot that if a sinner were suddenly taken out and plunged into the hottest fire on earth, what would happen? The poor person would freeze to death. All right? And so one preacher said this, all right? We continue. Look here now at Revelation chapter, here we go. He would freeze to death. And so nothing like frames freezing. All right, anyway, take your Bible and look at Revelation 14, verses 9 and onward. Revelation 14, verses 9 and onward. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be torn in tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Is it clear you don't want to receive the mark of the beast? Can you say amen? Would you agree we can't guess about what is the mark of the beast? Now that's not the scope. That's not within the purview of our topic this evening. That's just a little advertisement that you better be here when we deal with the mark of the beast, the image of the beast, the number of the beast that's coming up. But I want you to notice here, we understand the scriptures make it clear. If you receive the mark of the beast, you're going to go to hellfire. Is that clear? Yes or no? So what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? That's a direct quote from 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 17. In other words, he's asking, what is the destiny, the fate, the future of the, uh, those who are lost, the unsaved. I have a question for you as we launch into this subject of hellfire. Are babies burning in hell? I don't believe they are. But do you know that millions and millions and millions of people believe that they are? Do you know that millions of preachers believe this as well? Well, what does the Bible say? What kind of God do we have? 1 John 4, 8, God is love. Deuteronomy 32, verse 4, God is just. How many agree they're not diametrically opposed? They are blended perfectly together in our Father in heaven, in Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. By the way, there are not three gods. There is one God. But God is three persons, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Ask Jesus. Because who did Jesus pray to while he was here? He didn't pray to himself. Can you say amen? He prayed to his Father. And Jesus said, I'm going to ascend to the Father, and we're going to pray. We're going to give you the Holy Spirit. That's the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Can you say amen? So many have a distorted picture of God, though. You know, if you have a cell phone, I don't have my cell phone on me, but if I open up my cell phone, you know what you're going to see? You're going to see my picture of Jordan. I need to get a picture of both Jordan and Caleb in there. You're going to see how many of you have a picture of your loved ones in your cell phone. All right, if you don't, you better change that tonight. All right, anyway, you better put it in there. Anyway, let me ask you this. Why do you have, because that, that's more than a, a, a face. That is your love. That is your memories. That's, that's everything. Well, you know what? Every person is carrying around on them a picture of God whether you like it or not. You're carrying around in you a picture of God. So the question is, what kind of picture are you carrying around? Unfortunately, many have a distorted picture they have on them of God. And one of the number one reasons why people today have a distorted picture of God and is, misunderstand his character is because they have a misunderstanding and they have confusion in regard to hellfire and the fate of the wicked. Well, would you agree the truth about God's loving character, the truth about Jesus sets us free? And it's, and it's especially true when it comes to the subject of hellfire. Is hellfire in the book of Revelation? Is this a, a, a seminar focusing on Revelation and Daniel? It is. We need to understand this. What book of the Bible am I about to go to right now? Book of Revelation. What other book? The book of Daniel. Listen, many preachers are confused on this hot subject. The Bible makes it clear that the Antichrist, and we discovered that that's papal Rome, would blaspheme his name, God's name. What is this talking about, blaspheming his name? God's name represents his character. 
Just like when, you, when I say your name, I'm saying more than just the handle. I'm talking about you as a person, your character, your personality, etc. I want you to notice that here the Roman papal system would distort the character of God would misrepresent the character of God. Where, what, what entity, what religious system, what religious institution in the past has passed, has, has, has distorted and twisted a truth of God, there's truth about hellfire, and they have twisted it, and they have, have promoted it and promulgated it and perpetuated it, and it is confusing people, The Roman papal system has blasphemed the character of God, has maligned the character of God. Would you agree that's what the devil is all about? Why was this, this, uh, what started this great controversy? It was the devil, Lucifer, who became the devil, who started to undermine the character of God. What was he basically saying? Are you sure you can trust God? Are you really sure you can trust God? Are you really, really sure? I don't believe the devil just came out and said, you can't trust God. I believe it was very subtle. Are you sure you can trust God? Well, of course. I mean, think about it. Have you ever thought about it? You know, the angels, I believe, never thought about it. Until it was brought up, I believe it was a new thought. What? Trusting God. I think we can. No, I'm not so sure. Are you sure? And he started to undermine the character of God. Now listen, the character of God is trustworthy. But when it's distorted, it leads to distrust. Hell fire must be understood. Would you agree? We got to set the record straight. Can you say amen? So the Bible makes it clear that the Roman papal system would cast truth down to the ground. What is that saying? Daniel 8, verse 12. And this is speaking about the Roman papal system. What is it talking about? It would take truth, and Jesus is the truth. John 14, verse 6. And it would cast it to the ground. That is, it would twist the truth. Is there truth about hellfire? Is there truth about the Sabbath? Is there truth about salvation? Is there truth about baptism? Is there truth about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? The devil has a counterfeit for every truth of God. All right? Now watch this. Watch this. Jesus is our Redeemer. He came to reveal the character of the Father. Remember, Philip said, show us the Father. And Jesus said, I have been showing you the Father for my life. And I've known you now for a while, for three and a half years, I'm showing you the character of the Father. And Jesus, who represents the Father's character, wept over Jerusalem because Jesus said Jerusalem was going to be destroyed. It was destroyed by fire. So how Jesus responded to to his people in a city that were going to go up in flames is the way he would respond to the fate of the wicked and of the lost. Does that make sense? Yes or no? I want you to notice in Luke 19.31 it says Jesus wept over Jerusalem. And the Bible makes it very clear as he crested the Mount of Olives on his donkey. And he took in the panorama sweep of the city. All of a sudden, his form began to sway on that donkey. And all of a sudden, from his trembling figure, he began to heave sobs, uncontrollable anguish because of the fate of the prized city. He loved Jerusalem. It was the apple of his eye. But they rejected him. And he said, your house is left you desolate. And he wept and he cried. And that's a beacon of warning. Aren't you glad that Jesus said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you? Aren't you glad that Jesus is patient with all of us? Aren't you glad that you can blow it 
as times pass and the Lord has brought you back and you say amen? Aren't you glad he heals backsliding? But would you agree there is a day and there is a time when it'll be too late? Aren't you glad God is a God of second chances, but it's now high time to awake and to make your calling and election sure, as Peter said. And so listen carefully. The Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. But to save them. So the purpose of Jesus' coming is to save them. But he never forces people to be saved. So the, the alternative to accepting Jesus is to go to hellfire. Would you agree? There's, just, there's only two places, heaven and hell. And I want you to notice here, in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, it says, The Lord is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Can you say amen? Now, I want to recommend a book to you. You can go online and read this book. It's a book by Ellen G. White entitled Steps to Christ. If next to the Bible, if I was to pick a couple of books that really explain the Bible that I really like, it's Steps to Christ in a book called Desire of Ages. Listen to this quote in Steps to Christ about repentance. Would you agree? Jesus made it clear. Repent or go to hell. That's what Jesus taught. But he was very loving. Anytime he declared this, he always did it in love. Peter made the matter clear in his statement to the Israelites when he said, Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give, that's a gift, give repentance, that's sorrow for sin, give repentance to Israel, that's us, and forgiveness of sins. You say, Israel, I thought those are the people out over there. Well, there are people over there that are true Israelites, but remember it says in Romans 2, 28 and 29, it says there, he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, not of the flesh, but of the spirit. What does it say in Galatians 3, 29? If you are Christ, then he Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Are you Christ? You're Abraham's seed. Do you have the Holy Spirit within you? You're a Jew inwardly. Now, can Jews be saved? Same way Gentiles are. Makes no difference by the blood of Jesus Christ. So converted Jews and converted Gentiles, that's the true Israel in the last days. And so the Bible makes it very clear here. Remember Jesus said, remember Jesus said, the kingdom of God is taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruit thereof. Matthew 21 and verse 44. Remember he said that? What nation? Verse 43, pardon me. What was he talking about? Peter told us, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, Peter said, you, converted Jews, converted Gentiles, speaking about the Christian church, he said, you are that holy nation. You are that holy priesthood. You are his special people. He says, you were not his people, but now you are his people. You read this throughout the scriptures. Remember, the Bible says, all that are of Israel are not really of Israel. In other words, true Israel are those who have faith in Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? And so the Bible says here, we can no more repent, or I should say, I read Acts 5, 31, that he gives repentance. Many people think, I got to get my life together and then come to Jesus. That's wrong. You cannot do anything without him. John 15, 5, Jesus says you can do nothing without me. That includes repentance. That includes having a true sorrow for sin. I am so glad that he's the Alpha and Omega, the author and finisher, the beginning and the end. The Bible makes it very clear. The goodness of God leads us to repentance. But who can even help us to see the goodness of God? The Holy Spirit. I'm so glad that repentance is a response to what the Holy Spirit is doing. So if I'm bankrupt to the Holy Spirit, I don't even have the Holy Spirit, none, zero, zip. Guess what? I'm not going to go after God. I'm not going to seek God. I'm not even going to have a desire for God. But if I start to feel my sinfulness, I start to feel sorry for sin, I want to turn to God, that's the evidence of the power and the operation and the work of the Holy Spirit. John chapter 16 and verse 8, Jesus said that the work of the Holy Spirit was to convince or convict the world of sin. So we cannot repent in ourselves. So what am I saying? Repent or go to hell, but even repentance is a gift. Can you say amen?
How many people right now are getting drunk or on drugs or in some porn place or whatever, wherever they are, or just maybe not that extreme, just, you know, and sit in front of the television, nothing wrong with good programs. But what I'm saying is there's millions of people out there right now and they're thinking to themselves, I plan to come to God one day. Millions and millions and millions are planning on that. But they're trying to see if they can get their life together first. This message is for them. And I pray those watching by television, you will listen and be converted. Because the Bible teaches us we come to Christ just as we are. He does the work. He works in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And so some of us have been really making the Lord work hard. But aren't you glad? Here you are in his loving presence. We can no more repent without the spirit of Christ to awaken the conscience than we can be pardoned without Christ. Would you agree you can't be forgiven without Christ? And you can't be forgiven unless you repent. So he's got to do it. He's the Alpha and Omega, Revelation 22 and verse 13. And so listen to this. Christ is the source of every right impulse. He is the only one that can implant in the heart enmity against sin. Every desire for truth and purity, every conviction of our own sinfulness is an evidence that His Spirit is moving upon our hearts. Steps to Christ. I urge you to read that book. It'll transform your life. And so I see that Jesus said very clearly, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. But why would you recognize your spiritual poverty? Because the Holy Spirit took the scales off you. Sin will blind you. So that means you can't even find your way back to God, except the Holy Spirit draws you. And so, anyway, powerful quotation. So, listen carefully. Back to hellfire. Where in the Bible is such a doctrine of eternal, fiery torment? Is it really in the Bible? Is it really there? What does the Bible really teach about the fate of the lost? What does the Bible really, really say? Not what we're going to guess about it, but what does the Bible really say? I want you to take your Bible and turn with me to uh, Revelation chapter 1 and verse 3. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 3. Revelation 1 and verse 3. All right. And we're going to look there at verse 3. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. The time is here. Ready to be blessed by learning truth. These phrases in the Bible have been misunderstood. Eternal fire, everlasting punishment, unquenchable fire. What we're going to discover is eternal fire are the results, not the duration. The Bible says, the Bible says very categorically that hell fire is eternal fire, but what does that mean? Take your Bible and turn with me to 2 Peter. Take your Bible and turn with me to 2 Peter. 2 Peter is after the book of Hebrews. All right, 2 Peter. All right, we're going there, 2 Peter. And looking there, 2 Peter chapter 2. All righty, 2 Peter chapter 2. And looking there at verse number 9. Uh, no, before that, verse 6. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, they were notorious for their sin. Sodom and Gomorrah, and to ashes. Is it clear they were reduced to ashes? Yes or no? They were reduced to ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. Is it clear that Peter says the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah is an example and warning of what's going to happen to the wicked? Right? Is that clear? Yes or no? So Sodom and Gomorrah, the destruction, Sodom and Gomorrah being reduced to ashes is a striking example of what's going to happen to the wicked ultimately. Are you ready to see a rather interesting parallel scripture? Go 
a little bit closer to the book of Revelation. a matter of fact, it's as close as you can get to the book of Revelation. It's the book of Jude. Jude, looking there at Jude, all right, give you a moment to locate that, verse 7. As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Everybody say fire. What kind of fire? Eternal fire. I've got a question for you. Is Sodom and Gomorrah still burning? Yes or no? I've been over there. Uh, archaeologists, historians, Bible scholars tell us that Sodom and Gomorrah is underneath, destroyed, but there seems to be some evidence that Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed in that proximity, and they're underneath the Dead Sea. Now watch this. If Sodom and Gomorrah have been reduced to ashes, and they are no longer, it's no longer burning, then why does the 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 book of Jude, why does Jude use the expression, the two words, eternal fire, to describe what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? Obviously, it cannot be referring to the duration of the fire, not like that energizer bunny, you know, it keeps going and going. Are you with me? Watch this. No, no, no. It's not the duration of the fire, but it's what? The results of the fire. The term eternal fire is used not in a literal sense, but a figurative sense uh, uh, sense there. You understand? So eternal fire, what does that mean? It reduced Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes. Ashes don't burn. Last time I checked. All right? When you have a campfire, you're in Texas, and you're trying to get warm, and all you got ashes... Good luck, and I don't believe in luck. Now watch this. Eternal fire is talking about not the duration, but the results of the fire. It put Sodom and Gomorrah out of existence, reducing them to nothing, total annihilation, and that sentence, that executive judgment, had eternal results. It's an eternal fire. That is the fate of of the lost. Just like Sodom and Gomorrah. Eternal fire? Yeah. But eternal. It's so hot. It's a lot hotter than any preacher has ever preached it. It's so hot, it actually puts them out of existence. You say, I don't know, Mark. This is a little new to me. Hang on. We got, we got plenty of, uh, of support. Jesus said in Matthew 25, he said there that the wicked or that, and that the devil are going to suffer everlasting punishment. What does this mean? Well, furthermore, the Bible says that the fire at the close of the millennium, we've already read it, will reduce the wicked. It says it devours them. Peter said, reduces them to ashes. Malachi chapter 4, verses 1 and 3 makes it clear that the wicked will be reduced to ashes and they'll be ashes figuratively speaking, under the soles of our feet. Now watch this. The Bible makes it clear that the fate of the wicked is everlasting punishment. Notice, number one, it has to harmonize with all the other scriptures. Does that make sense? Yes or no? Number two, number two, remember, all scripture must harmonize. Number two, Jesus said it's the fate of the wicked, and he did not say it's everlasting punishment punishing. I want you to notice, once again, everlasting is not duration in terms of, uh, you know, the punishing just keeps going on and on and on, but rather they receive their punishment. What is it? Reduced to ashes, and it's an everlasting punishment. They're not going to have a comeback. Is that clear? Yes or no? Okay, what about the expression unquenchable fire? 
In Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 27, it says there that Jerusalem, because they were breaking God's law, specifically the Sabbath, and they were treating it as a regular day, God said, I'm going to destroy this city with unquenchable fire. I've been over to Jerusalem. Anyone been to Jerusalem? I've been to Jerusalem, and guess what? It's not ablaze. It's still not on fire. But come on now. God and Jeremiah told the people that the city was going was to receive a judgment of unquenchable fire. When did that happen? When Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Jerusalem around 605 B.C., before Christ. Well, guess what? It was unquenchable fire. No man could put it out until it completed its executive phase of judgment, namely accomplishing the judgment work that God had purposed. No man could get in the way. No man could divert it or, or avert the disaster. No man could prevent it or stop it. It was unquenchable fire. Did the fire go out? It did. But did it have a, an ongoing consequence? Absolutely. And what was that? Destruction. Until God would say, okay, you've learned your lesson. Remember, it caused an unquenchable fire. Now, I want you to notice here, it, it, the Bible is very clear about this, that Jerusalem had a comeback. Didn't God show mercy upon them? Yes or no? But that is not going to be showed to the wicked. No, the wicked are going to suffer uh, something far greater. And so I want you to notice here the truth about hell. When is hell? After the millennium. Where is hell? On planet Earth. Why is hell? To put sinners out of existence. Who is going to go to hell? All those who don't accept Jesus Christ, who refuse to follow the light that God has given to them. What is hellfire? Total annihilation of the wicked. How long is hellfire? However long it takes to reduce them to ashes, and that won't take long. So let's deal with this a little bit more. Let's explore this. Jesus loved to give parables, and he gave a parable about the fate of the wicked. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. When everyone, timing is everything, at the end of this world. When is that? At the end of the millennium. That's when the judgment takes place. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity. When is hellfire? At the end of the millennium. At the end of this world. And shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Matthew 13, 40 to 42. Jesus put it this way. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him when? In the last day. That's when they receive the judgment, the executed phase of judgment. John 12, verse 48. Now listen carefully. Are the wicked dead being punished now? No, they're not. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. Will they be punished? They will. That's their future. But when? Not when they die. They're reserved in the grave until what? Until the day of judgment. That's when the wicked are going to be punished. When the day of judgment takes place at the end of the millennium. Okay, the Bible is very crystal clear about that. So let's continue. That's 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 9. Where are the dead now? Let's go to John chapter 5. John chapter 5. Are we learning something? All right, John chapter 5. You're supposed to say yes. All right, John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29. All right, let's look there. Jesus said, do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life. Those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. There are two distinct resurrections. The resurrection of life and the resurrection of damnation. Resurrection of life, the righteous dead come out of their dusty graves when Jesus comes again. They receive an immortal body and they go to be with the Lord. Can you say amen? And that's when they're going to be absent from this mortal body and present with the Lord with an immortal body. The Bible says in Philippians 3, we get a brand new body like Jesus. Can you say amen? And so the Bible makes it very clear. Where are the dead now? No mystery about it. 
This truth, is this issue of what happens to a person when they die and where do they go, there's no mystery about it. There's no perplexity about it. There's no confusion about it. Would you agree man makes complicated what God makes clear? The Bible makes it very clear. All that are in the graves, you say, Mark, wait a minute, I'm a little confused. I thought when you die, if you're righteous, you go right to heaven. If you're not righteous, you go right to hell. Just wait a second. Our last presentation and this presentation are like twin presentations, one complementing and supplementing the other one. Now watch this. Where, how many believe Jesus tonight? Where are the dead now? Jesus said they're in the graves, both the wicked and the dead. Jesus did not say, well, the wicked, they're in hell. Uh, no, he said they're in the grave. He said, well, Mark, that's just talking about the body. You know, their bodies there in the grave, but they're really in hell fire. No, the Bible makes it very clear that the wicked are going to go to hell fire at the end of the millennium. And watch this, watch this. We, we can't cover this in one sentence. It's coming together. We're putting the puzzle together. Where are the wicked dead? Brought to the grave and shall remain in the tomb. Job 21, verses 30 and 32. From the cluster of scriptures we've already looked at, it is crystal clear no one is in hell now because they're reserved unto the day of judgment to be punished. You say, well, Mark, I'm a little confused. I mean, what happens when a man dies? I thought either they go right to he heaven or hell. They have a disembodied soul that goes to heaven and their shell, their body, you know, stays here until a resurrection. Now watch this. Jesus said all that are in the graves. He didn't say their body is in the grave and they really are in heaven. No, he said all that are in the graves, they shall hear his voice. Now I want you to notice here. Let's put the puzzle together. When God formed man, he formed, the Lord formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So I'm looking at a lot of precious living souls, if you're awake. All right, anyway, here we go. All the while, my breath is in me, and the Spirit of God is in my nostrils. Put these two texts together, and what do we learn? Dust plus spirit or breath, equals the living soul. What did he breathe into our nostrils? The breath of life. What is that breath of life? The Spirit of God. So the Bible makes it very crystal clear that when we die, the reverse of this happens. You see, death is the reverse of creation. And so, <clears throat> notice, whoops, notice what the Bible says here. Notice what the Scriptures teach here. What happens when a man dies? Read it together with me. Are you ready? Nice and loud. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit shall return unto God who gave it. What is that Spirit? It's in your nostrils. It's the breath of life. Nothing that thinks, that which enables us to think. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7. His breath, what happens when we die? Psalms 146, verse 4. Notice we're looking at a series of scriptures. His breath goeth forth. He returneth to the earth. It doesn't say his body. It says he returneth to the earth. In that very day, his thoughts perish. Now, I don't know how much clearer this could be. God is saying when a person dies, they're really dead. Now, people, that's not popular today. People don't want to hear that. And you know what? That's nothing new. Egyptians, Babylonians, Greeks, you've heard of Greek mythology. Everybody in the past did not want to accept reality. When you die, you die. They didn't want to accept that. So well, they built these pyramids. The pyramid known as the house of the Ka, K-A, the house of the soul. And all cultures are this way. We, we just don't want to be told when you die, you're really dead. But Jesus said, all that are in the graves shall come forth. Either the resurrection of life or the resurrection of damnation. Jesus made it simple. I love Jesus for that. Hey, man, now I'm going to have to have a talk with Paul when I go to heaven and say, what, what, what's up with this, man? Why would you make it so difficult sometimes? Anyway, I love Paul's writings. All right. Would you agree? Even Peter said that Paul has written some things that are hard to be understood. Now, if Peter said that, I can say it. I love Paul's writings, though. Amen? We need all scriptures given by inspiration of God. But what am I saying? I'm saying don't just read Paul's writings. Read Jesus' writings. Bring them all together. And don't just read Jesus' writings. Read Paul's writings as too. Is that making sense? Yes or no? So I want you to notice, his breath goeth forth. He returneth through the earth. In that very day, what happens to his thoughts? Gone. 
They don't know anything. That's what the Bible teaches. So what happens when a man dies? All the while my breath is in me and the Spirit of God is in my nostrils. Remember Jesus said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. The word spirit there means breath. For the body without the spirit is dead. James chapter 2 and verse 26, I believe it is there. And in the Greek, for the body without the pneuma, that's a Greek word, pneuma, is dead. The Bible, the body without the pneuma is dead. The word pneuma, pneumonia, comes from that Greek word pneuma, from which we get, what's a pneumonia have to do with? Breathing complications, breathing. And so the Bible makes it very clear. The body without the breath is dead. That's plain and simple. A child can understand that. That's why when when children come to a funeral and the pastor wants to preach that person up to heaven and so forth, the child's looking at the body, but they're being told, well, they're really not there. Don't worry. They're up in heaven looking down, or we don't want to talk of the other place where they might be. That's That's not scriptures. Jesus said, let the children come to me. They can understand the truth far more better than adults who've been, well, Influenced by the Roman papal power. Where did this false doctrine of the immortality of the soul and an eternally burning hell that's going on now, where did it come from? It came from paganism, but then it was adopted into the Roman papal system. And so listen very carefully. Dust plus spirit equals living soul. Now the Bible uses the term sleep 66 times to describe the unconscious state of the dead. How did Jesus view death? Remember his friend Lazarus passed away? You remember, our friend Lazarus sleepeth. But then he had to clarify because the disciples were a little confused about the true status of Lazarus. And Jesus said, Lazarus is dead. Plain, simple, but not what they wanted to hear. And tonight, in the last couple, last night, last night and tonight, I've made it very clear the dead are dead. But you know, we have a hard time accepting that because we have loved ones and we don't want, we want to know they're looking up from heaven down upon us. The Bible makes it very clear that we will not go to heaven until Jesus comes again. What did Jesus say? Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you. When? When? When I come again. I thought you receive us at death. No, no, no. I'll receive you when I come. That where I am, there you may be also. John 14, 1 to 3. So the Bible makes it very clear the the hope of the Christian is not when you die, you go to be with the Lord. The blessed hope is the glorious appearing of Jesus when we all together, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ. I love that. Death doesn't separate us from Jesus. It says the dead in in Christ. They're dead, but they're in Christ. Can you say amen? If I die, I'm not worried about it as long as I'm in Christ. Can you say amen? The Bible says the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we always be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So if you hear words that say they've died and died and they've gone to be with the Lord. That's not these words. These words are, we're going to meet the Lord together with the righteous dead who've been resurrected. We're all going to meet together in the air to be with the Lord forever. Comfort one another with these words. There is a true comfort and there's a false comfort. I want the true comfort, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And so the Bible makes it very clear. By the way, there's another scripture I want to take you. We're going to the book of Revelation. What book are we going to? Come on now, how many love the book of Revelation? Amen. This is a prophecy seminar, and I'm giving you lots of prophecy tonight. Lots of prophecy tonight. All right, Revelation 14. Lots of prophecy to understand. This is a very important subject that's that's woven into the, the book of Revelation. Revelation 14. Looking there at verse number 13. The Bible says, Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, Blessed are the dead. Uh -uh. 
You can't even catch a breath right there. You, can't even, you cannot pause after the word dead. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Now that's better. Can you say amen? Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works to follow them. The Bible says their works will follow them, not when they die, but when they're resurrected. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Did they die? They are dead. But they're going to get a reward. When? Next verse. Then I looked and behold a white cloud and on the cloud one sat like, one of those, like the son of man having on his head a golden crown. This is Jesus coming as king of kings and lord of lords. That's when the blessed who die in the Lord are going to be resurrected. Now that's being blessed. This is clear, amen? This is crystal clear that you're blessed. Blessed are those who die in the Lord. Don't tell me that a person who dies, who's given their heart to the Lord, is not dead. They are dead. They died, but they're in the Lord. So the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, 35 to 39, it says there, Paul said, not even death can separate us from the love of God. Didn't Jesus said the very hairs of your head are all numbered? Now, hallelujah, somebody's going to get this tonight. So our, this was a sneak preview of the resurrection. Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came forth and he had no eloquent testimony to bear about the bliss and glories of heaven. Why? The man didn't know anything. He was really dead. Otherwise, he would have come down here and had a strong complaint. Why didn't you leave me alone? Leave me up there, right? But he didn't have anything to say. And so I want you to notice the dead know not anything. Now, what part of that don't we understand? It is crystal clear. A child can understand it. The dead know not anything, but people are being taught, no, 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 when you die, you know more than ever before. I mean, then you really know everything. No, you will. But the hope of the Christian is not death. The hope of the Christian is Jesus coming again to raise the righteous dead. That's the hope of the Christian. And so his breath goeth forth, he returneth to his earth, and that very day his thoughts perish. That's what the scriptures teach. The dead praise not the Lord, Psalms 115, verse 17. David is not ascended into the heavens, Acts 2 and verse 34. The dead are dead. And that's why the resurrection is so powerful. Otherwise, if you put people with a disembodied soul in heaven, and then there's the resurrection, it's like, isn't that a little anticlimactic? Like, you know, you're in heaven. You know, don't know what you're doing up there. I mean, do souls eat? You know, can you eat from the tree of life if you're a disembodied soul? I mean, do you need that nourishment? I mean, what do you, what do, you do in heaven if you're a disembodied soul? Doesn't make any sense. And so... Jesus says, okay, I'm going to come again. Okay, let's go down there and get your body. A little anticlimactic. Doesn't make any sense. No, no, no. Let me tell you something. A righteous dead are waiting. But aren't you glad they have no consciousness of time? When they close their eyes in death, in a twinkling of an eye, blink of an eye, snap of a finger, less than a second, when they close their eyes, they're not going to come out and say, whew, let me tell you what it was like to be dead for 500 years or 1,000 years or a year, whatever. And have all these stories about, oh, wow, so that's what it was like to be dead 1,000 years. No. They're going to say, like, what did I miss? <laughs> you were dead 1,000 years ago. Aren't you glad that God's way, his thoughts are higher than our thoughts? And so can we find a hope that goes beyond the grave? It's when Jesus comes again. When shall we be with the Lord? When he comes again. <clears throat> I quoted those scriptures. I love this poem. When as a child I laughed and wept, <clears throat> time crept. Then as a boy I ran and talked, time walked. When I later became a man, time ran. As older still I daily grew, time flew. Soon I shall find when traveling on. Time gone. Time flies. By the way, this is why I love the Sabbath. Because people let life pass them by. But those who know about the Sabbath know this is a whole day with God and the Holy Spirit. And they push the pause button and say, oh no, not going to let life pass me by. Rush people today, it's 24-7. And people who say, well, I keep the Lord's Day on Sunday. They don't even keep Sunday. <clears throat> 
I'm here to tell you that God wants us to hit that pause button. God said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And the Bible says in Isaiah 66, 22 and 23, we're even going to keep it in the earth made new. Can you say amen? So listen, we got to keep going. What will happen to the wicked in hellfire? Eternal death. You see, the Bible makes it very clear the opposite of eternal life is not eternal life in hell. I'll say it again. Rewind play. The opposite of eternal life is not eternal life in hell. The opposite of eternal life is eternal death. Dead. Gone. Kaput. Annihilated. That's what the Bible teaches according to the scriptures. What will happen to the wicked? Eternal death. What does the Bible call the destruction of the wicked in hellfire? The second death. Why? Because all of the wicked die, or when Jesus comes, they can't endure the brightness of His coming, and they die. And so they're all dead. But then after the millennium, all the wicked are resurrected. As I read there in Revelation 20, they think they can overtake the city. Fire of God comes down and devours them. That's the second death, and they're never resurrected after that. And by the way, there at the end of the millennium, that's when every knee shall bow, every tongue confess at the great white throne judgment that Jesus Christ is Lord. There are the righteous who do that inside the city with the Lamb, and there are those who are lost outside the city, including the devil. Every knee shall bow and every tongue confess Jesus Christ is Lord. And after they do that, it is seen that God is just and true, and the fire of God comes down and devours them. God can be trusted. Can you say amen? So what is the end result of sin? The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. The wicked, therefore, do not receive eternal life in hellfire. But many people are taught, no, no, no. Would you agree that if hellfire, the duration of it, kept burning and burning for zillions of years, however long that is, who would keep that fire going? Could the devil keep it going? No, he's the one suffering it, right? So my question is, who would keep that fire going? Who would keep, you know, you've got to have a little bit of fuel there. How? It would have to be God. Would you agree? God would have to be the one to keep the fire going. You mean to tell me that that would be just? Oh, no, Mark, they're, lo they're lost. So in other words, within God's character, he has a desire and he has a commitment to make sure that those who don't accept them, he'll keep them suffering and he'll keep it up through all eternity. My friends, that would not be heaven for me. I would never want to serve a God like that. That is a dictator worse than Hitler. And that, no wonder millions of people, no thanks, I'm not interested in God. And really, I'm not interested in that God either. So you need to tell these people, the God that you don't want to follow, we're not following him. We're following God, God's love in the fires of hell. Will the wicked suffer in hellfire? Oh, yeah, they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I don't know. Maybe some will burn for days. I don't know. We don't know how long, but we do know this. They'll be put out of existence. Do you know that this argument has made the front... Uh, cover of U.S. News and World Report a number of years ago. Hell, a new vision of the netherworld, the second death. Some theologians say, and I believe them, that the end of the wicked is destruction, not eternal suffering. There are theologians that believe that, and I am among them. I believe this. That was in U.S. News and World Report, January 31 in the year 2000. Do you know that Jesus on the cross gave us a little idea of the fate of the wicked? How many agree Jesus tasted the fate of the wicked? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He experienced the wrath of God. What are the wicked going to experience in hellfire? The wrath of God. What is the wrath of God? Eternal separation. Well, can you live apart from God? Isn't God life? I mean, the wicked don't have their own life. So what is the result of eternal separation? The wicked are out of existence. I mean, you know, they've, they've lost it. God's not going to keep them. How many agree? If God was going to keep them alive, he has to give them breath. No, he's separated from them. That's the wrath of God. Total, what happened? What happened to Jesus when he experienced the wrath of God? When he experienced that eternal separation, he said, my God, my God, you forever left me. That's all he could see. He still never gave up faith, though, and that's the difference.
He said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And he bowed his head upon his chest and he died. He died not being able to see how he was going to be resurrected. Oh my God, you've forsaken me, but I'm not going to let you go. Though you slay me, yet will I trust you. And so, Jesus showed us that Jesus suffered in torment on the cross, but he did die. So the wicked will suffer for a while, this eternal separation, but they will die because there is no life apart from God. And so I want you to notice, do we have an immortal soul? Only God hath immortality. Man is mortal. We seek for immortality, but the soul that sinneth, it shall die. We receive immortality when Jesus comes again. Well, you say, well, Mark, we just have a few moments left. You say, Mark, what about the rich man and Lazarus? Why did you have to bring that up? All right, no, I'm glad you did. Let's go to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. We're going to receive immortality when Jesus comes again. Look at Luke 16. All right, go there very quickly in our remaining moments. All right, Luke 16, looking there, verse 19. All right, now, the question I want to ask you is, does, har does Scripture harmonize, yes or no? So, whatever Jesus is saying, it has to harmonize with what he has said, and Paul has said, and Peter has said, and Jude has said, and John has said in other scriptures. You see, we don't want to be guilty of trying to go by two scriptures that say one, seem to say one thing and, and leave 90. Let me illustrate it this way. Let's say that you, were, you had some property, you're a farmer, and here in Texas, you bought some property. Wouldn't that be nice? Bought some property, some acreage. You have 100 acres, and you're lining up fence posts, and you've got a portion of your property there, and you're lining up the fence posts, and you've got 100 posts, and you're just about to set the wiring on it and so forth, and you've got to make sure you get your posts right, and you're getting your sheep and goats. All right, so anyway, you line them up, and you look there, and your wife or, or your husband brings you some lemonade and so forth, and uh, you're looking... And you say, oh boy, two out of the hundred are a little, a uh, couple feet to the right. Oh boy. And you tell your sweetheart as you're sipping lemonade, I've got to move 98 of those to join those other two. Can you imagine that? And your sweetheart says, well, why don't you move the other two in alignment with the 98? Good idea. <laughs> don't work harder, work wiser. So it is that sometimes people want to take the rich man and Lazarus and say that all those other scriptures, well, all those other scriptures must come to the rich man and Lazarus. No, no, no. You must take rich man and Lazarus and have them harmonize with all of the other, the preponderance of evidence. What, what, what is a jury supposed to do? Go with the weight of evidence. Oh, yeah, it seems that there's scriptures on both sides, right? I will grant you that. But let me tell you something. You go with the weight of evidence, and you will see that every one of those scriptures comes out on one side. Can you say amen? Now, let me prove this. The question is this. Is this to be taken literally or figuratively? Well... Did Jesus ever before use figurative parables? There was one parable where Jesus talked. Matter of fact, let's go there very quickly. All right, I'm going to do this very quickly. All right, because I want to set this up. You got to, I got to set it up right before we deal with it real quick. And our time is up, but, you know, here we go. All right, Matthew chapter 20. And I want you to notice here in uh, Matthew chapter 20. And uh, looking there, I'll give you the scripture here. All uh, righty, just hold on just a second. Okay, Matthew 22, that's why it wasn't working. Okay, Matthew 22, we can do this. All right, here we go. Verse uh, 2. The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son and sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding and they went, were not willing to come. Again, he sent out other servants saying, tell them who were invited, see, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and fatted cattle are killed. And, you know, anyway, come to the wedding, come to the wedding. And, uh, but then I want you to notice here, I want you to notice here verse 11. So this wedding, this is represents... Jesus Christ and the coming of Christ. How many agree? When he comes, we're going to the wedding, right? All right, now watch this. Verse 11. But when the king came in to see the guests, which would represent those who went to heaven, 
He saw a man there who had, did not have on a wedding garment, so he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. Now let's apply that literally. That would mean that there are going to be guests around that marriage supper table of the Lamb. We're all there like, wow, we're here. You know, we get the grape juice, we get the, it's unfermented wine. But at any rate, we're there, you know, at the table, and we're ready to have a festive occasion. We're ready to feast. And then all of a sudden, we hear there's an interruption, and a couple of angels grab a few people and say, these guys have got to go. Somehow, they got up here, and they have got to go to hellfire. If you're going to take that literally, that's what it's saying. Would you agree? It's figurative. Jesus is basically saying, you're not going to go to heaven unless you trust in my righteousness. You're trusting in me for salvation. And I'm sure there are other examples. I'll give you one other example. In the book of Judges, I, I want to say it's Judges 16, I, uh, but it talks about a parable of trees. And it talks about how one tree talked to another tree and the trees were talking. And it was a parable. It was a story. So the question is, are you going to take that literal or figurative? If you take it literal, the, the environmentalists will really love you. We believe trees talk. <laughs> All right, you didn't get that, but that's okay. Let's go back. Let's go back. We need to conclude. Luke chapter 16. All right, Luke 16. By the way, I love trees. Hug a tree. All right, anyway. There was a certain man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores who had laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. Jesus, a master storyteller. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. Now, if you're going to take this literally, Abraham is a fat guy. Because there's a whole lot of people here gathered to his bosom. All right? The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Now, this is a parable. Jesus was teaching. Basically, here's what Jesus was doing. They believed in the time of Christ, if you have riches, it's a sign you have the favor of God. It's a sign you're probably going to go to heaven. And what was happening is the Pharisees were very covetous. They loved, they wanted riches and so forth. And so... Jesus was tying, trying to pull the rug from underneath them and expose that covetousness is not going to get you into heaven. And riches are not a sign that you're automatically going to be saved. So here's what Jesus did. Instead of teaching them the truth about hellfire and everything, instead he just took what they believed, which is some erroneous teachings that they believed, and Jesus just said, okay, let's just flip characters. I'm going to put a rich man in hell, and I'm going to put that poor man, I'm going to put him, him up in heaven. That got their attention. You see, Jesus told this story in such a gripping way so as to shock them and help them to realize, uh-oh, you mean to tell me all this wealth and so forth? I'm, I may be lost. That's what Jesus is trying to say. Watch out for covetousness. Now watch. Let's take this literally. The rich man also died and was buried, and being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. I want you to notice here that whatever this is, it has eyes, and it has a mouth, and it's speaking. It's, these are people, and they're, they can look up to heaven, and they can talk to people in heaven, if you take this literally. So that means that you would be in heaven minding your own business and you got a little hungry and you navigated over to the tree of life and you're just about to have a peaceful moment and have a little quick bite to eat and you get a nice orange or whatever your favorite fruit there from the tree of life and all of a sudden you hear, Psst. Psst. this is your Uncle George, remember me, hey, have a little pity. Oh, man, you've been talking to me every week now. Come on now. Can't have it both ways. If this is going to be taken literally, that means that people in hell are going to, which we know does not exist yet, all right? Jesus just flipping characters around. If you're going to take it, apply it literally, that that means there's going to be wicked pestering you to death in heaven. And you want, you, you, let's listen to Jesus elaborate on this. 
Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I'm in torment in this flame. I want you to notice here. He's saying, you know, please send Lazarus. Have him just dip the tip of his finger in water and come down here and cool my tongue. Question, would a, would a little droplet of water make any difference at all? Uh, that's equivalent to, let's say you're in the shower and you're having a nice, relaxing, refreshing shower and all of a sudden, somebody out there in the kitchen turned on cold water, full blast out there. And you're left with scalding hot water and you yell out, would you please dip the tip of your finger in cool water and come in here and cool my tongue? Not going to make much difference. Jesus is speaking tongue in cheek. He, how many agree? He's a master storyteller. He has this fine way of giving these parables to make it so memorable it's written down. And I don't have time to get into all the detail, but basically what it's saying here, Jesus is saying, don't think because you have riches you're going to heaven. And don't think because you're poor you're going to be lost. And watch out for covetousness. That's the thrust of the parable. And then I take you the Bible. We got to close. We're just about there. Matthew 5, Matthew 5, and verse 30. I'm going to leave you one clear scripture. And then right after this, we have one more scripture, and that's it. Bible says there's no such thing as an undying soul. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. If I was to give you one scripture, one that makes it clear that no one is in hell now, but they will go, the wicked will go to hell and be annihilated. One scripture. You say, Mark, I, I can't remember all the scripture. All right, let me give you one scripture. St stands out bold relief. All right, here we go. Matthew 5 and verse 30. Remember Jesus said in the context, if you lust after a woman, that would apply to a man as well, you commit adultery in your heart. And you know what he says? You're going to go to hell fire. That's what he says here. You look at the context. It says verse uh, 27. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, whoever looks at a woman to lust after her has already committed adultery in his heart. If your right eye of causes you to sin, See, your eyes can cause you to sin. Pluck it out. Gouge out your eye. Cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than your whole body, whole body, whole body be cast into hell. So Jesus is saying here, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast in hell. What is Jesus saying? Nobody's in hell yet. Because what Jesus is saying is that when a person does go to hell, their whole body goes there. Question. Are any of the wicked bodies in hell? Obviously a child can understand that one. Are the wicked going to go to hellfire? They are. But when? At the close of the millennium. One more scripture and we're done. I want you to take your Bible and turn with me to 1 John. 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. We close with these words. 1 John chapter 5, verse number 11. I love this scripture. Have we learned a lot tonight? I saved the best for last. He saves the best for last. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in His Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. That you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God.
loving Father, thank you that you paid the price. We don't have to go to hell. Thank you, Jesus, that your way is the best way. You can be trusted. You have a loving character. I pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit now. I just pray, Lord, bless all those watching my television. May we surrender our life to Jesus Christ who is our bridge to heaven. Thank you, Lord, that you have delivered us from hellfire. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.